We saw smoke out of the chimney once again as Mark Pope landed another transfer for the Kentucky Wildcats. Are they finally done building a roster in Lexington? You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, folks? Happy Friday and welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, a daily national college hoop show, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are your co-hosts. I'm Andy Patton. He is Isaac Shade. You are listening to the place to get your college basketball content, not just from November through March, but <laughs> every day, five days per week, per week here on Locked On College Basketball. I want to thank all of you who have made this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. And shout out those of you who are everyday listeners who are hanging out with us five days a week. And those of you who have joined our Discord channel, if you have not done so yet, there's a link in the show notes. It's free to join. Come hang out with us. Talk in college hoops all the time. Today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by Game Time. Folks, download the Game Time app now, create an account, and use code Locked On College, and you'll get $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Well, Isaac, we got a couple of blue blood programs to talk about here to start off the show. We'll talk about Kentucky, whether Mark Pope's roster is finalized in Lexington. We'll talk about Duke adding another guard out of the AAC, what that means for John Shire's club. We're going to close the show talking about Riley Kugel finding another home and a handful of other transfer portal additions that took place over the last couple of days, kind of rounding them up to get you out into the weekend. But Isaac, we start in Lexington, as we so often do in what has been an insanely eventful offseason for Big Blue Nation, uh, replacing an entire roster of players. And their 11th edition has come through Ansley Almanor from Fairleigh Dickinson University, six foot seven forward, has committed to Kentucky. He was kind of soft committed to Siena for like a week, 10 days or so before that fell apart. And obviously he is now committed to Kentucky. I don't know if Siena has ever lost a recruiting battle to Kentucky. This might be the first time that has ever happened, uh, but a nice pickup here for Mark Pope. Yeah. And not because they don't, not because they beat Kentucky, but because why would they ever be in the market for the same player, which is wild. It feels weird. Welcome to 2024, everybody. Yeah. Andy, I mean, this is great, and I, th I think we'll say this uh, about Duke here in just a second. This is a great, in my opinion, depth mm -hmm. add for Kentucky. I don't spec, expect, excuse me, Almanor to be, um, you know, in the starting five, but um, in terms of like a front court guy, and some mm -hmm. in terms of somebody that that can um, do some things there for Kentucky and an athlete. But look, this dude while he's six seven, and you you noted it in our show notes, but he is a specialist from yeah. outside, which is interesting because they've also got that from Kobe Brea. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you can get these dudes on the court together, we know that both Kentucky as a team last year, which doesn't really hold any water for next year, <laughs> but with what Mark Pope was doing at BYU, we've wondered, will Kentucky still continue to run like that kind of thing? Some of these signs of, of who he's getting are pointing to uh, all systems are bomb away from outside still for the Wildcats. Yeah, Mark Pope loves three-point shooting. He loves it. He loved it at BYU. He loved it at Utah Valley. You can tell he's trying to bring it with him over here to Lexington. You got you, you mentioned Kobe Brea. He's obviously the most notable of the outside shooters who have joined this program so far. But Kirk Creesa was very efficient last year at West Virginia as a three-point shooter. Some of the freshmen coming in are expected to be good outside shooters. Uh, you have guys like Andrew Carr who can space the floor as kind of stretch bigs. And now you add in Almanor here who shot 40% from three last year on Isaac's seven and a half attempts per game. Wild. This is a high volume, high efficiency outside shooter. And I think you're absolutely right. He is not going to be shooting seven and a half three point attempts per game for Kentucky because he will not be playing enough minutes to do that. But to be able to have a player who can play the four, who could probably play the five in small ball lineups, although that would be very small. Uh, it's still something that depending on the matchup, depending on the opponent, I think Kentucky might be able to do. But ultimately, you have the ability to bring in another player who can kind of play in the front court and space the floor and do the things that Mark Pope likes to do. I'm with you. Probably not a huge minute role here, uh, especially with Amari Williams, with Brandon Garrison, with Andrew Carr, all in the mix in the front court. I think those guys are probably going to soak up the majority of those minutes, but you need 
you need more guys. You need more depth. Yeah. And for Mark Pope to go out and land a player like this who kind of seems to fit what he likes to do uh, in his system, I think is a great kind of what I expect to be. And we can kind of transition into this, what I expect to be the <laughs> final addition uh, for this this roster in terms of like scholarship players going into next year. Yeah, and yeah, and I think you're right. For those who are unaware, college basketball, we talk about this a lot this time of year, mm -hmm. but in college basketball, you get 13 scholarships. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, in the pre-transfer portal, pre-NIL era, you mm -hmm. would utilize all 13 of these except for extenuating circumstances because guys are affixed to your team. Mm -hmm. In this day and age, a lot of coaches are not using all 13. They will use 10, 11, 12 Rare is the occasion that we mm -hmm. see 13 scholarships go to scholarship level players. Right. So this is why Andy can ask this question. Is Kentucky done? They've mm -hmm. got 11. We can we can even have a, a, a lineup conversation looking at, you know, I said, I don't think Almanor is in the starting five. So who is? Mm -hmm. But Andy, I think before that, we, we asked the question. Are th Let me ask it to you this way. As you look at these 11, and we've got them listed out here in front of us, are there any glaring holes that you see that Mark Pope still needs to fill? No. <laughs> yeah. well, like, I'm, I, I'm So in terms of like positional needs, no. I, you have you have enough bigs, you have enough guards, you have enough wings. Like I think that there, there's not a glaring hole positionally, but there, the thing that would concern me about this roster at this point is there's like, there's not a lot of star power. Like usually I can look at a, a roster, especially when you're talking about sec teams, teams that are going to be in that conversation for, you know, top five seeds and sweet 16s and so on. And you can tell pretty clearly who's going to be their leading scorer. I genuinely have no idea who is going to be the go-to scoring option for this Kentucky team. I do not know if they'd been able to add somebody like a, like a Jackson Robinson or a Wooga Poplar or even a great Osibor, or like some of the other players that had been connected to them. I think that those are players who might've stepped into that role. I like a lot of the additions here, but Kirk Kreese is not a score first guard. Lamont Butler's not a score first guard. Kobe Brea is a role player, a very good one, but he is a role player. Like, is it Andrew Carr? Is it Brandon Garrison? Like, are they going to run through bigs and, and have those guys kind of be the, the, the go-to scoring options? I don't see anybody on this roster that stands out as an obvious, that's the dude who, who we get the ball to in a late game situation. That's who we funnel the offense through. This roster is not set up that way. And it may work fine for Mark Pope. They may be able to make this work. But if I'm talking about what is a hole on this roster, I just don't really see a go-to, you know, there's, there's certainly nobody like Antonio Reeves on this roster right now for Kentucky. Yeah. I would even say there's no, like a Dillingham man. It's right. like, I know, I know he's coming off the bench last year, right. but crunch time, give the ball to freaking Rob Dillingham yep. and let him cook. I'm Andy, Andy. That's such a good way to say it. And that no, that you gave me was the most <laughs> meaning filled. No, I think I've heard in a long time. So I get me, you know what? Maybe Al Manor is the dude. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> like, but I think it's such a good point. Yeah. And I'm, and that could be to their advantage in certain ways of like, you know, if, if I'm the opposing, if I'm Rick Barnes and I'm drawing mm -hmm. up a play uh, for how to defend this final shot, I don't know who I'm defending because I don't know who they're going to be. Right. So like there, I guess there's a, a, some silver lining to that, but Mark Pope needs a dude. Mm -hmm. And to your good point, Andy, I don't know that he's got it yet. Yeah. And I, I'm looking at, you know, we tried to make some potential starting lineups here and, and I wrote out one here and, and I'm, I'm curious for, for you, Isaac, and then for people listening to the show, if you agree, disagree with what we think this lineup's going to look like. But in my mind, you probably go Kirk Kreese at the one, you got Brea and Otega away on the wings. Uh, you got, Brandon, or excuse me, Andrew Carr and Brandon Garrison in the front court. And then you have Lamont Butler coming off the bench, Amari Williams, the Drexel transfer big is off the bench. You got the freshman coming off the bench and Perry and Noah and Colin Chandler. Uh, and then Almanor is in that mix as well. And, and again, I look at that starting lineup and I'm like, I think it, I think it's probably Carr just because I don't think that you're putting the ball in Brea's hands a bunch, like because he's just more of a shooter. But it's it's a it's a lineup that I think is very talented, but it feels like it's five role players and not really any star power. I almost wonder because of that if they're if he's going to mess around a little bit, Coach mm -hmm. Pope. Like, because like I look at the and like I I agree in principle, but I'm like Lamont Butler's coming off the bench, right? Right. But but I know because you and I have talked about it before. It's like yeah, but it's just because of what he does, you mm -hmm. you need Crease's playmaking ability. Yeah. 
I could see Amari Williams and, and Brandon Garrison, mm-hmm. you know, like I think that's going to be a camp battle to watch, like a quarterback yeah. battle to watch kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, and I think that all, all of that rolls into what the conversation you just had about a dude or not having it, Andy. So um, really, really interesting. And, and to all these points, then we're going to have to have some conversations this offseason. You and I were talking about this off air about where does Kentucky fit in the echelon of the SEC this year? We'll look at all that later. Now, interestingly, we just talked about Kentucky adding depth. We believe that Duke has done the same thing as they add their fourth transfer and second guard out of the AAC as Coach John Shire continues to find role players to build around Tyrese Proctor, Cooper Flag, and that crazy talented group of freshmen that Flag is part of. We'll discuss the roster in Durham coming up in just a second. Right after I tell you about game time. Look, Andy, I don't know about you. I'm stoked for these NBA playoffs that are going on right now. I'd love to just go get to a game. There's nothing really all that close to me, but it should be fun to get off on a road trip and on a last-minute whim, get there. Well, good news for me or Andy, who's much closer than I am, (laughs) game time is an authorized ticket marketplace of the NBA, which makes getting playoff tickets even faster and easier. In fact, prices on the game time app Andy, this is wild to me. They actually go down as you get closer to tip off. So they've got killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat and a best price guarantee. And with all of that, game time takes the guesswork out of buying these NBA tickets. And you know, I often am really worried. I'm an over worrier. I admit it, but I worry about my third party tickets being bogus. I'm going to get turned away at the gate, but with game time ticket coverage, your purchase is covered by the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. I love that peace of mind. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time, download the app, create an account and use code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on college for $20 off terms apply. Download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Andy, we stay in the blue blood ranks and we turn our attention from Lexington to Durham, Durham, North Carolina, (laughs) where we've speculated a lot about, all right, John Shire has this stupidly overwhelmingly talented freshman class coming in. I mean, it's another really, really good one. But the cupboard was bare because so many guys transferred out. And so we we wondered early on, is Duke going to be able to get guys to come and commit out of the transfer portal that get the assignment? You know what I mean? Like guys that are willing to come and be supportive role players that don't have to have a ton of shots, that complement what they already have, that are veterans who can support that. And I believe, Andy, that Duke has just done that for the fourth time with the addition of Rice guard Cam Sheffield, 6'6 grad transfer with two years of eligibility remaining. Andy, we can talk about the other three transfers, but where is your big take on that? Is Sheffield a guy that can come in and be that thing that we're talking about Duke needing? Yeah, I think so. And I, I think he's he's a quality addition defensively. He's big. He's a physical wing. He had drew 27 charges in his last season at Rice. He, he, he loves to, to get dirty, get physical. Uh, he's Again, he's big, and he's a really good outside shooter. And, and when you can kind of combine those things, and that, that's been a, a calling card for Duke in the additions they've made so far is like bigger guys who can shoot threes. Mason Gillis is a very obvious example of that. Uh, Sion James from Tulane is a bigger guard as well. He was more of a, a score first guard than, than any of these other guys were at their previous stops, but Sheffield's a guy who he didn't play last year. He had a foot injury. So that's why he's a grad transfer who has two years of eligibility remaining. He wasn't a, a, a high profile scorer when he did play at Rice. His final season was 22, 23, and that was 7.6 points per game. That's the most he ever averaged while at Rice. He also averaged six boards. So he's again, a, a good rebounder, a physical defender. And I think that you look at, at, again, you compare him to Mason Gillis. You compare him a little bit to Sion James. Malik Brown's not a three-point shooter, but he's also a, a uh, not not ball-dominant scorer. He's an efficient scorer, but he doesn't need the ball in his hands. And that's defense. kind of been the theme of all of the additions that John Shire has made. And I think it is a very intentional strategy that Shire and the the staff and it's part partly out of necessity again I don't think you can go out and get ball dominant players when you when those players know that Tyrese Proctor is here they know that Caleb Foster is here they know that 
um, Cooper Flag is here and that those guys are going to get the ball in their hands a lot. And so you go out and you find guys who can come in and, you know, score six, seven, eight points a game. There's less pressure on them. They just need to be standstill corner three point shooters. And I think you can sell those players to come to your program because you're Duke. Like other programs, it's harder to convince like player like a player like Mason Gillis or Sheffield. We either could be a good example of like I have one or two years left in my college career. Up to this point, I haven't been this, you know, double digit high level scorer. I want to go somewhere where I can do that. And you could probably transfer to a mid-major program that, you know, runs the heck out of the ball, a Samford type team and go out and score 15 points per game. But if you go to Duke, you might win a national championship. And even if you don't, you get to say you played basketball at Duke. And I think that is the selling point that John Shire is able to tell these kids, hey, come here, play with one of the most exciting freshmen that we've had in a very long time in this sport, uh, play in the ACC, you know, play on a high level. We're going to have national media at every single game. And we're going to ask you to play a role that we know you're comfortable with, that you're capable of filling. And I think that Duke has the ability to sell that. And clearly they've been, they've added four players who all kind of fit that bill. And I think that this is a, a very intentional, very strategic and very successful offseason so far for the Blue Devils without adding any star power because they just didn't need to do that. They needed to supplement the pieces they already had. And I think they've done a tremendous job of that. Yeah, Andy, I think a lot of people from the outside looking in are going to see every one of these four individually and collectively and say, that's not sexy. What right. is John Shire doing? But as you and I sit here and look at this, refute me if you disagree. Mm -hmm. I think this is exactly mm -hmm. what Duke had to add to be highly successful this year. And I say great effort from John Shire and company. Andy, I'm right with you. I believe that John Shire in, in his messaging to every one of these guys, he's not sugarcoated it, right? Because mm -hmm. that would not work to be like, come to Duke and mm -hmm. drop, you know, 15 and 10 a game. Mm -hmm. It's, hey, I need you to come play in Cameron Indoor Stadium, mentor these young men, play tough-nosed basketball mm -hmm. and help us get where we need to get. And I like, I, I, you know, don't obviously know exactly what he said, but it's gotta mm -hmm. be some form of that conversation. And clearly he's doing that very well. Cause all four of these guys, including Mason Gillis, who just played in the national championship right. game. Oh, by the way, have bought into that in a big way. And I think the, the, the reason that this works so well is because it was a strong pivot from what didn't work last year. And I don't blame TJ Power and Sean Stewart and even Mark Mitchell and those guys for, for hitting the transfer portal. They saw the freshmen coming in. They knew that their playing time that they had last year was probably not going to increase. Uh, and it was maybe not even going to stay, stay the same. And so for Shire, it was like, okay, we already have a bunch of freshmen coming in. Some of these guys probably won't play as much as they want to. And frankly, next year at this time, we will probably see players transfer out of Duke after being there for one year. But Shire recognized, okay, we don't have guys who can fill these roles. These freshmen are like the guys that we planned to have in those roles who were here last year all left. So instead, we're going to find veteran guys who are comfortable with that role who were, were not trying to sell them on, stay here for three years and become a superstar in 2027. Like That's not the selling point. The selling point is come here right now and compete for a championship. And the decision to pivot to that and recognize that that's the need for this roster was really smart. And I think it's really going to pay off because again, I don't think that this team can continue to cycle through you know freshmen who transfer out after one year. Like There are other programs that are doing that and maybe it'll work for them. I don't know. But I like that Duke is trying this strategy because I think it's going to be better for the personnel that they have on this roster. And I think it's going to do wonders for them next year in the ACC. Well, Isaac, we got some transfer portal updates to get you a Friday afternoon six pack, as it were. We're going to start with Riley Kugel. He found a new home back in the SEC. He transferred from Florida, was committed to Kansas, now headed to Mississippi State. We're going to talk about that and a handful of other transfers coming up in just a second. Right after I tell you about today's sponsor, FanDuel. Folks, it is winner take all time right now in the NBA and NHL. And FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Because right now, new customers will get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and more. 
And since we were just talking about Duke, they currently have the third highest odds to win the national championship in 2025. They're at plus 1,200 right now. Kansas is in the lead at plus 1,000. And UConn, if you're feeling like the three-peat might be happening there, they are at plus 1,100. So visit FanDuel.com right now, or excuse me, FanDuel.com slash locked on right now and make a playoff shot count. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. All right, Isaac, closing out the show and the week with some transfer portal updates, some that just happened right before we hit record, That's some true. that are a day or two old that we're getting to here to close out the week. Why don't you start us off with the big news, one of the big stories coming out of the SEC? Yes, Riley Kugel finds a new home again. <laughs> Andy, uh, Riley Kugel had left Florida to head off to Lawrence, Kansas to play for Bill Self. Interestingly, committed you know pretty early on in the transfer mm -hmm. portal this year, and then I think he just sat around and saw other guys coming in mm -hmm. and recently decommitted from the Jayhawks, and I get it. And basically, for those wondering, uh, I can't remember if he decommitted before the transfer portal closed or not, but basically, uh, as long as you haven't signed on the dotted mm -hmm. line yet, you haven't done anything official, and you can just stay in the transfer portal, basically. Yes. Um, so, Kugel65207 has two years of eligibility left. He heads off to Starkville where he better get used to hearing some cowbells ringing because mm -hmm. that's what they do at all these games. Um, and Andy, you know, a lot of people thought he would have a really big follow-up sophomore year to a great mm -hmm. freshman campaign at Florida. He just didn't quite get there. Uh, you and I maybe even thought that a little bit heading into the season. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and, you know, you hate it to be wrong about things like that, but, mm -hmm. but, it was last year at Florida, 9.2 points, three and a half rebounds, one and a half assists, 1.1 steals. He just needs to shoot better, man. 31.2 from three and 69.6 .6 from the free throw line. But still, I think this is a good get for Chris Chans and hopefully new home, new stats. Moving over to the Big 12 here, TCU brings in a guy who might lead this team in scoring next year. That's Trezarian White coming over from UNC Wilmington. He was a Kentucky killer last year, as we recall, UNC Wilmington going and getting that win at Rupp Arena. White had 27 in that game against the Wildcats. Not even just a one-off performance for White. He also dropped 28 at Arkansas in the same season. When this dude's playing SEC teams, he is ready to roll. <laughs> he had three games of 30 or more points last year. And in fact, my co-host here, Isaac, noted this. Eight scoring, his eight highest scoring games last year were all in true road games. This dude loves the heat. He loves to light it up when he's in those opportunities. He's got one year of eligibility left. Six foot six forward coming to TCU, averaged a hair under 20 and seven last year at Wilmington. Uh, we've seen a handful of players leave TCU this offseason, but they bring in Frankie Collins from Arizona State. They got a couple other guys coming in. Now they add Trezarian White, a guy who I think is going to have a lot of success in the Big 12 next year. Speaking of purple Big 12 teams, Achora Achor from Samford is headed to K-State. 6'9 big man has been at Samford the past two years after being at community college before that last year, Andy. 16 and 6, almost two blocks a game. I mean, just did stuff. And let's remember that he also shot over 40% from three, 43.5%, albeit on just shy of two attempts a game. But when your 6'9 big man can step out and do that with that level of efficiency, mm -hmm. we'll take it. Folks, I'm sure you remember him from the Kansas game. This is a dude that can turn it on at a moment's notice, has a big motor played in that buckyball system at Sanford that gets up and down. He can do that, but he can also grind when he needs to. Had 28 and 14 against Furman in the SoCon semifinals, 25 and 9 in the title game win over ETSU, and then 23 and 8 uh, in the loss to Kansas. So it was on fire at the end of the season. We'll see how he keeps it going in Manhattan. Sticking with purple Big 12 teams, sticking with Kansas State. Actually, Day Day Ames transfers from Kansas State and goes to join Tony Bennett at Virginia. Three years remaining, Ames was a top 100 prospect when he went to Manhattan last year. Didn't get a ton of, of opportunities to score the basketball for Jerome Tang's team. Average just under just over five points per game, about two assists. Was not a particularly efficient shooter, about 33% from three. But again, player with a lot of pedigree going over to Virginia where they have to replace Reese Speakman, they have to replace Ryan Dunn. Uh, we've actually seen Tony Bennett has a bit of an interesting strategy. They've had five <laughs> transfers come in this year, and three of those five have three years of eligibility remaining. One of them, Elijah Saunders, has two years left, and then one of them, Jalen Warley, has just the one 
year remaining coming from Florida State. Uh, I like this class, especially with Ames coming in for Virginia, but I'm not sure if Bennett is going to be able to keep all of these guys for three or more years. We'll see how that shakes out for him. But uh, Ames is a talented player who I think could get unlocked, especially as a defender uh, in Virginia's system. Man, if it does work and they do stay, though, and mm-hmm. they can buy into what – Tony Bennett is such a good basketball guy. Yeah. I mean, it's just, that's going to be interesting to watch, Andy. That's a great point. Number five, Simon Zapala commits – to Michigan State, a 6'11 center with one year of eligibility remaining after three years at Utah State. 1.2 points a game, Andy, last year. Great, great stuff. I'm just kidding. Uh, 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 and then played last year at Longwood, 9.8 points a game, five and 5.6 boards, and just under a block a game in 17 minutes a game for the Longwood Lancers. We'll see, Andy. I, I just I don't know what he'll be able to bring at Michigan state. I mean, maybe the Izzo magic dust, you sprinkle on him and something happens. But uh, I think for me, this is just the depth ad for yeah. Sparty and we'll keep our eyes on it. Just those, those big men are are highly coveted in the transfer portal right now. We're seeing a lot of guys who if you're six ten or taller. You're probably ending up at a spot, maybe a little bit above, uh, above the pay grade as it were. And that seems to be the case here with Zapala, but Hey, who knows? Maybe it'll work out for Tom Izzo and the Spartans. Number six, uh, we did a lot, a lot of teams in purple uniforms, so we're going to stick with that here. Emmanuel Inocente, Tarleton State Guard, has transferred to Gonzaga, the third transfer portal addition for Mark Few in the Zags. He's a six foot five wing from Italy. Uh, the numbers don't really jump off the page. About six and a half points, six and a half rebounds per game last year. Uh, did average two point nine assists and one point seven steals. Uh, but he was a true freshman. He was all whack defender, all whack freshman team, um, and he's probably not going to be a rotation player for Gonzaga. They already have a pretty full rotation when they added Caliph Battle from Arkansas. I was like, okay, no more additions are going to be able to play for Mark Few and Gonzaga. They don't have enough room. And then a week later, they go get this guy in Achente. Now, he does have three years of eligibility remaining. And for Gonzaga, Nolan Hickman and Ryan Nembhard and Caliph Battle and Michael Ajayi are all out of eligibility after this upcoming season. So that leaves two years for Inocente to carve out a significant role as a physical wing, as a defender, uh, potentially developing into a bigger offensive threat going from Billy Gillespie's system at Tarleton State to Mark Few system at Gonzaga is going to be quite a bit of a change for Inocente. It's probably a good thing. He's going to have a year, probably not going to fully redshirt, but not going to be much uh, playing time for him next year. But as long as he learns that system, could be a big piece for Mark Few and the Zags for his final two years after that. You know, Andy, speaking of old Billy Clyde, I'm surprised Kentucky didn't give him a call about their job opening. <laughs> I think, are I you think, are you really surprised? I will. You know, I think he might have fit in pretty well in Lexington. You know, I, I you know, hey, they, I, Carlton State finished second in the whack, man. You never know. He just seems like the kind of coach that would thrive in in Kentucky. I think Big Blue Nation really is disappointed that 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 he didn't go. No, uh, dude, we jest, Andy. We jest, um, folks. Thanks so much for joining us on today's show. Fun conversations. We can't wait to be whack back with you on Monday. Make sure you tap into that. If you haven't subscribed to the show on audio and video, super easy to do on your favorite format for audio. And then make sure, of course, that you are subscribed on YouTube. If you're not part of the Locked On College Basketball Discord community, as Andy talked about earlier, we'd love to have you. It's free to join the links in the show notes. Come on in. As always, apologies to the lawyer family. What up, Mason Gillis? Let's go Wildcats. And until Monday. Peace.